Alf Autopsy, Part 2. I didn't own a laser disc player, so the disc was forgotten for a couple weeks. It spent some time on the coffee table, on the floor under the sofa, propped up beside the TV, anywhere it could be ignored. I had no intention of ever doing anything with it, and it certainly wasn't I certainly wasn't going to buy a laser disc player just to find out the disc was damaged beyond repair. An American friend was over one day and noticed the disc. He asked about it, and I told him how I had acquired it. He agreed it looked unlikely to play, and also couldn't read the handwritten kanji on the sleeve, but said he knew a Japanese technical expert with the equipment and know-how to potentially salvage it. He contacted him, and a couple days later, when he was available, we visited him at his apartment. Most Japanese living rooms have the usual stuff, seating, TV, dining table, etc. But in this apartment, the living room was full of sound and video equipment, computers, digital and analog tape decks, wires stretched and tangled everywhere, monitor screens, and speakers in stacks. He took one look at the laser disc and agreed there wouldn't be much surviving data, but what there was he could salvage. He had a high-end player called Muse High Vision, which he said could read through defects that a normal player couldn't. That ran through a processing amplifier into the capture card of one of his many PCs and the specialist software it contained. He told us he would not need time, oh, he would need time to clean it up and encode it, and we should leave him to it as it would be boring to watch and talk about it. We agreed and went to a nearby bar for a few beers and a couple rounds of yakitori, grilled skewers of different parts of chicken, breast, neck, crispy skin, meatballs, hearts, liver, cartilage. It's great beer food. That's not disgusting. Our technical expert friend knew that where we were and said he would be round to collect us when we'd finished. A couple of hours later, when we were nicely drunk and our bellies were full, we began to we began wondering if he would be beside much longer. Just as my friend was about to make a call, our technical expert was suddenly standing there beside our table. His face was white and gaunt. Whiter and gaunter than you'd expect from someone with such a dedication to digital technology. And he placed the laser disc with its sleeve and a black DVD box on the table. Without saying anything, he turned to leave. My friend and I looked at each other and he grabbed the techie sleeve with a... What? Despite his reluctance, we got him to sit with us and had a drink brought over to him. He quickly drank it like he couldn't wait to be out of there and wouldn't answer any questions about what he'd found on the disc. He said it was all there on a dot .avi stored on the DVD and we should take it and go. He repeatedly warned us about watching it. He detected it from his computer and we would be well advised to destroy both discs and forget about them. Wasn't this story about Alf? I asked him if he could read the scrawled kanji from the laser disc sleeve. It means nothing, he said. Nothing he could understand anyway. He said it was an ancient character set and compared it to me trying to decipher an old English written in the d densest Gothic script. He didn't want payment for his work. He just wanted to forget about it. But I managed to force three 1,000 yen notes into his hand. He thanked me repeatedly, graciously bowing his head, and asked pathetically if he could go now. We said sure, and he got up and basically ran out of the door without another word. At this point, we could not understand his reaction at all. He was either a very eccentric and nervous man normally, or he had seen something terribly unsettling that he was struggling to come to terms with. And we, of course, had had a few drinks, so we dismissed him as a weirdo and laughed about it. But in retrospect, I know his behavior had been understandable. In fact, I think he held it together well just by bringing the discs to us. Had I been in his position, I may have disappeared from contact, turned off my phone, and ignored the doorbell until we went away. I may have called the police and reported us for suspicion of committing insane and terrible crimes. I may have babbled and drooled my way into a secure mental institute where I could bang my head against soft walls until I died alone and old except for the insects in my mind and under my skin. Soon we left the bar. Excited to get back to my apartment and watch the disc.
and much to my regret, regret that is what we did. With a few cans of Chu Hai to keep the drinking mood going, I stuck the unlabeled DVD into the drive of my laptop. There was one file on the disk with a .abi file with a random alphanumeric name, something like 000-A54H4.abi. I double-clicked it and full-screened the video. It troubles me to think back to what we saw. Those terrible sights that sobered us up and kept us from finishing our drinks. That has kept sleep away for most of the last five years and effectively ended our friendship. That ruined our night and troubled our lives. Regardless, I will try to remember all I saw of that video. A disgusting nightmare vision of what appeared to be the lost final episode of the 1980s American family sitcom ALF. The conclusion to the cliffhanger which saw him captured by the alien task force. The video began with a loud, high-pitched, squealing sine wave tearing through our ears. On screen was a test card pattern, vertical bands of bright color at the top half, box of black, white, and gray at the bottom. This remained on screen for about a minute, occasionally broken up by pixelated blocks of digital distortion, the whole while accompanied by the high-pitched sine wave. Suddenly nothing. Black screen and silence. After a wait, which felt like minutes, but could just as easily have been seconds. The screen flickered like an old video cassette, presumably from an earlier analog to digital transfer, and still the occasional explosions of digital distortion from the corrupted laser disc. The NHK logo began fading into the black background, but suddenly glitched out, the screen breaking up into pixelated blocks and shouting out with a burst of white noise that disappeared as quickly as it appeared. What remained on the flickering screen was a view of a down, dirty, down, dimly lit corridor. The floor and walls appeared tiled like some sort of hospital, but filthy and damaged everywhere, as though it had been the scene of floods and massacres. Most of the lights were out, the ones that worked flickered in intermittently. The only sound was the occasional electronic buzz of the lights, almost too quiet to perceive. All down the corridor into the distance were double hospital doors and windows at eye level. A quite pathetic whimper or a groan of pain and defeat emerged slowly through the electronic buzz, a tearful sobbing of someone reduced to helplessness by torture and humiliation. Suddenly, digital distortion ripped away the image and brought it back with the camera moving down the corridor and screaming guttural roars. Someone in one of the rooms was evidently being subjected to a hyenas ordeal, which words could not express, only the scream of an anesthetized cutting and tearing. Up until this point, we had been fairly good-humored about the video, but something about the screaming and sobbing unsettled us. This was not the sound of acting, more the sound of real agony. The sound of someone or something being maimed and mauled by the hands trained by the art of cruelty. As the camera continued down the corridor and the screaming grew worse and worse, other voices joined in. Various desperate calls and screams in a range of pitches and bizarre alien languages tore out as if from being imprisoned in rooms leading out off from the corridor. They howled in response to the pain of their fellow inmate. The screams built and built to a crescendo, and the flickering video distortion worsened to the point that the picture was completely obscured. And just as the noise was so bad, I thought I would cry. More digital distortion and white noise ripped through everything. The picture returned with an image that shocked us, made us cry out in horror and surprise, and almost an absurd burp of laughter. The chorus of screams was silenced, and the image on screen was so unexpected to us. The collision of the familiar childhood image with such unspeakable viciousness, a contradiction that broke our minds. Filling the screen was Alf, the alien life form from the TV series of the same name. The shot was close up, showing his head and shoulders from above as he lay strapped to a stainless steel dissection table. White light poured down on him from a shot, making the image stark and ex overexposed even through the flicker of worn-out video. He lay, with his head to one side, 
his fur matted with dark blood and various wires and electrodes penetrating the top of his head. He sobbed gently. His pain was unbearable, genuine suffering which made us desperate to reach out and help a fellow living creature. His expression of pain was both human and animal. He began to turn his head. The effort was clearly about as much as he could muster. And after a few failed attempts and tired whimpers, he faced the camera with closed eyes. More digital distortion and white noise than Alf opened his eyes, beaten and bloodshot. Strangely human eyes, as though a person were trapped beneath Alf's skin. He tried to speak. Please! I miss you! He croaked. I miss you! His words were translated into Japanese subtitles. And as the title, the word ALF in big white letters of that familiar font and its katakana Japanese subtitle translation appeared on screen, ALF let out a horrendous blood-curdling scream out of breath and panting and screaming and screaming until his voice was hoarse and he could scream no more. But still, between sobs and desperate gasps for breath, he screamed and screamed and screamed. He stared into the camera with those teared-up, dying, pleading eyes staring at us, at me, as he screamed and screamed. This must have gone on for a few minutes at least, and just when we thought we could take no more, just when the constant screaming was eating away at our very souls, that terrible saxophone music started. We couldn't believe it. Along with the continued screams, the saxophone-led theme song from the third and fourth seasons of ALF began to play. It was that same music, but somehow raw, as it pushed through overloaded speakers and re-recorded onto a wax cylinder, then blasted out again at ear-splitting volume. And between interspersed cuts of jolly scenes from the past, shots of the Tanner family, credits, Starring Max Wright and Sheedon. And random clip rips of the analog and digital distortion increasing in severity all the time were images of terrible torture. A close up of a hand being drilled, a leg being hobbled with a sledgehammer, and all the while that hideous screaming and panting and screaming and crying. The quality of the footage was deteriorating still, and as the happy memories and torture and miserable wails and distortion and saxophone music and white noise coalesced, I began to feel sick. All those terrible experiences built up to a roar, and suddenly the video jumped and stuck on a loop, a split second of smiling Willie Tanner with starring Max Wright emblazoned across. A full body shot of Alp strapped to the tabletop with his torso peeled open, revealing the bleeding, beating insides of his alien anatomy. These two hideous images jumping, cutting, looping between each other at regular intervals. All the while, the screaming, the white noise, the distorting lumpen saxophone stuck, stuck, stuck. And I swear... Under all the clamor, I could hear the maniacal laughter of Alf himself. These two images looped for so long that I began to think it was the actual .avi that I was skipping somehow. But checking it, I saw the BLC time slider moving along naturally. The looping continued until more serious distortion obliterated all sound and visuals, replacing them with pixelated blocks and indistinguishable noise. When the picture returned, it was of a lower quality still, and the scene had changed. The camera, now camcorder quality, seemed to be lying slightly over to its side on a tabletop, looking across the room to the autopsy table where Alf lay strapped down. Lighting was dim, and a green tinge to the picture suggested night vision. The scene was obscured by someone stepping in front of the camera, a person in doctor's scrubs, gloves, and apron all heavily stained with blood and shit. They adjusted the camera slightly and stepped back out of shot. Alf, who may have been lying unconscious, seemed to have come to and began mumbling and whimpering and begging, No, no, please, no! His head moving side to side slightly. He appeared delirious, distressed, and barely alive. 
The doctor walked back into shot and stood with his back to the camera beside Alf and the autopsy table. His features were covered with a gray surgeon's hat and face mask. He stood over Alf, looking down on him, and appeared to be talking. We couldn't hear a word he said, just the occasional calm consonant penetrating through Alf sobbing and pleading, and the slight movements of head and shoulders. The scene remained unchanged except for the persistent random interference of distortion for maybe five minutes. Five minutes of inaudible calm speech. Unchanged except for occasional jump cuts to the smiling faces of Kate Lynn and Brian Tanner, who seemed to be looking on in curious glee. It was as though the surgeon, the torturer, was explaining the matter of factly exactly what he was going to be doing to Alf. The sobbing and pleading continued throughout. Then a brief flash of distortion and white noise leading suddenly to blackness. I don't know how long the blackness here lasted. It may not even have been on the video. Perhaps I passed out momentarily or shocked, just left a blank hole in my memory. Whatever really happened when the picture came back, the scene had changed yet again. The camera was on the move, held in the hand of someone I presumed to be the surgeon, not pointed at anything but swinging about wildly with the movements of the arm. This was dizzying, producing blurred effects of blood-stained walls and spilled gore like an abattoir floor. Soon it steadied and swung around to the autopsy table where lay the mutilated headless corpse of Alf. Jump cut to Kate Lynn and Brian in happy conversation. Camera panned along the body and upwards toward the ceiling, towards the source of an arrhythmic drip drip of dark liquid. Probably blood. There, hanging by cables and wires, was the severed, silenced head of Alf, his scalp shaved and ears snipped off to allow access for the multitudinous penetrating electrodes. Below the stump of his neck hung the spine pulled from his body, and though, although I didn't notice at the time, in retrospect, it occurred to me there was something wrong. Well, obviously it was all wrong. I mean, there was something not as you'd expect about the spine. Rather than being the repeating structure of small separate vertebrae, the spine began at the neck as two long, thin, parallel bones which ran the half, length, half the length and terminating at a joint where they connected to a single, thicker bone running down the rest of the way. Thinking back, I'd become convinced over time that Alf's spine was not a spine, but the bones I saw were the radius, ulna, and humerus of a human arm. As the camera held on this scene for a moment, and the words created by Paul Fusco faded onto screen, Alf's eyes blinked open and he looked directly at the camera. The voice of the cameraman sounded, the voice of the surgeon, the voice of Willie Tanner saying, Good morning, Alf. Alf screamed a scream of guttural anguish in the credit sequence roll. Humorous pictures of Alf drinking from the toilet, trying on glasses, speak, peeking through the blinds, wearing headphones, all that stuff. But instead of the theme tune playing, it was just all that screaming, desperate panting and crying. 